I was doing a lot of nodding and smiling as we were listening to Eleanor and Tanya and Joe because a lot of our key messages that we'd like to share sit really well with, the, with that wonderful project. Mr Bassett's schoolroom is, is also a story of collaboration that we'd like to share with you today. It's a collaboration of organisations and people, the National Trust of South Australia, particularly the Wollonga branch of the Department for Education and Child Development in South Australia, the Wollonga Primary School students and staff, and the particular community museums in Wollonga. It's also a collaboration of ideas about bringing community museums and digital technologies together, and a very timely, um, very timely collaboration with the with the implementation of the Australian curriculum and the rollout of the MBN, etc. In South Australia, we're, all primary schools are fully implementing Australian curriculum for the first four learning areas, science, English, history and mathematics this year. So all primary schools are teaching, assessing, planning and reporting against the, those four areas this year. Um, the introduction of the Australian curriculum presents an ideal opportunity for us to really think about what it is that we want our students to be learning, but also how it is that we want them to experience that learning. You may be aware that we, obviously that we've got the Australian curriculum, but each state is responsible for the pedagogical approach that, that, that the Australian curriculum is going to be delivered through. If we and as I said, there's an ideal time for us to be really thinking about the strategic intent of the Australian curriculum and what it is that we want our students to be experiencing through the curriculum and taking away. And if we think about the Australian curriculum as one of the key strategies for achieving the goals outlined in the 2008 Melbourne Declaration, particularly goal two that says that we need a curriculum that develops young people who are successful learners, creative and confident individuals and active and informed citizens. If we think about the curriculum as a vehicle, as a tool for developing those characteristics in young people, how do we work with it so that we achieve that? And so this was the thinking in South Australia and in my team, I'm, I'm in the pedagogy team with a particular focus on history, but looking at all of, oh, sorry, all of the areas, really thinking about how can we work with the curriculum that develop those characteristics in our young people? How can we not be slaves to the curriculum, but make it work for us? So we've been developing a lot of resources and strategies for school leaders and teachers to, to work with, to lead their own learning in how they're going to work with this curriculum in their classrooms. Like I said, my focus is particularly on history, but these key <coughs> messages fit with the curriculum as a whole and each learning area. So, what I'm really saying is that let's not do history, but let's think about how we can use Australian curriculum history to develop the kinds of young people described in the Melbourne Declaration. What role does history play in developing young people who are active and informed citizens, confident and creative individuals? So let's um, our resources and our approach in South Australia are very much about this idea, shifting our thinking from doing history to using Australian curriculum history, which is coming up, using Australian curriculum history to as a vehicle for developing historical thinking. So rather than doing the first fleet or doing explorers or doing ancient Egypt, yet let's use that rich historical content to develop students, to develop a way of thinking. And obviously this means we're asking teachers and leaders and schools to do a, a pretty dramatic shift in paradigm, shift in thinking, re-evaluating re and rethinking the way that we think about curriculum content. So moving away from curriculum content as being something that we have to cover and tick off to being a vehicle, as I keep saying, to develop these deep understandings and big ideas that we want our learners to take out into the world with them. And then obviously this has implications for how we think about teaching, that teaching isn't 
just covering content, but it's um, developing this way of thinking with students. So if history, if a um, particular focus on history, we want to look at developing historical thinkers, developing young people who are able to think, work and process like historians and use the content of the Australian curriculum in powerful ways as learners. This is best articulated in the Australian curriculum through these seven key concepts. So the idea of historical thinking is described and articulated through this, these seven concepts, things like significance, continuity and change, cause and effect, empathy, perspectives, etc. And what's really useful about these concepts is that these are the concepts that develop right across from the first year of school to year 12 in the Australian curriculum. So it doesn't matter where you are along that continuum, where you're working with students, it's these concepts that you might be going after. It's also these concepts and historical skills that teachers are being asked to assess against the achievement standards. So you won't see something like in year four, students describe key aspects of the first fleet as one of the achievement status but you will see students um, are able to describe causes of change and then the first fleet may be one of the vehicles that you use for developing that bigger idea but obviously a, f a five year old um, five year old's way of demonstrating and understanding one of these concepts uh, empathy significance is going to look different to a year 10 or year 12 way of describing of demonstrating those concepts. Obviously there's some development in sophistication and complexity that's built into the curriculum and also the historical context that we, our students are demonstrating these understandings. So we start off in the first year of school looking at our own stories as five-year-olds in our own place in time and then gradually broaden the historical focus until we're looking at global perspectives and Australia's place in those in, in year 10. So what we wanted to do in South Australia was really focus on this idea of historical thinking and support our teachers in developing this historical thinking, bringing in the content strands, so bringing in this, the historical knowledge and understandings, whether it's ancient world or, or local history, bringing that in and the inquiry skills that are really important for um, facilitating learning in history. So how do we bring all of that together so that our students are able to think, process and work as historians? So what we began to do was really unpack what, what does that look like? If somebody's thinking historically, working historically and processing like an historian, what are they actually doing? So bringing together all the aspects of the curriculum, and this work's been done across all of the learning areas, but obviously I'm sharing the history example with you. So we have, what does it look like when somebody's thinking, working like a scientist or a mathematician or a powerful user of language? But unpacking that idea, bringing in the scope and sequence and these concepts, this idea of that we're developing historical thinkers. And what we're saying for, but through this work is that that looks very similar, whether you're a five-year-old historian, um, a 10-year-old historian, somebody in year 12, a university level historian, or somebody researching their own family history. There's a, there is a way of thinking historically that we, can, that we can pretty much put into this broad model. So historians always start with story, and it might be a building. If you're a maybe seven, eight, nine-year-old historian, there might be a story in your local town like this building in Wollonga that turns out to be an old school. So there's a story on the very streets of the town that we live in. So starting with a story, historians then move on to asking questions, beginning an historical inquiry. So if we're starting with the story of this old schoolhouse in Wollonga, we have students who are attending a school in the very same town that looks very different there's their new gym built from the, the Burr money, <laughs> Julia's money. But so if I'm a student attending this school in Wollonga and I'm hearing about stories about another school, it's starting to generate some questions that as a historian I might investigate. And the next thing that historians need to ask is what can we use to find out? So 
how can we, where can we locate sources that might help to answer and inform our inquiry questions? These historian students might visit the old school house. They might talk to somebody who knows some information about it, like the volunteer that they're interacting with at the old school house. They might um, visit the lo local community museum and source some documents and photographs. They might access those online. And once historians have located and identified primary and secondary sources for their inquiry, of course they need to analyse and use and interrogate these sources. They need to make sense of them. They need to look for patterns to compare and contrast. They need to um, make judgments about what are the significant aspects of this story that need to be told. What, what other questions do we have? How can we use all of these, whoops, I meant to move on to that. How can we use all of these sources to answer our questions and to think historically? And then, of course, historians communicate their findings. So what, who are we going to, who might want to know these stories? What are the really important stories that need to be told and what's the best way to tell them? Um, we might make a documentary, we might reenact history like we've just seen in that lovely Victorian example and we might um, use the sources as part of that communication. So those questions, what are the stories, what, um, what, can we, what questions do we have, what can we use to find out, how can we use these to find out and then how can we communicate this? Uh, are, a bit, are a framework in the resource that we've developed in South Australia for helping teachers to think of history as a way of developing, as a way of working and as a way of thinking that we want for our students. And then that's the very bones, those questions are the bones of what it means to be thinking historically at different levels and then we have a lot of other resources that help teachers to think and work that way. Also for finding the links, as was mentioned in the, the previous talk about um, composite or multi-age classes, particularly so in some of our little schools, we have uh, classes of year rece uh, re reception year one, year two, year three in one class. So how do teachers use this idea of thinking historically to bring out the important parts but still covering what they need to in the curriculum? So the last two, I have two more points I'd like to make before Jill talks of, um, shares Mr Bassett's school um, story with you that what we're what we were doing in what we're doing in Wollonga is developing a model for historical thinking so I guess my thing about doing history this is not about doing Wollonga <laughs> but it's about using Wollonga's story and to develop a model for a way of thinking that can be relevant for anybody for any context for any teacher working with a class of young historians to that investigate the history of their own school or a significant place in their in their community. So it, it raises um, what we were trying to do is show this model, a model that can inf help other people to develop their own models of historical thinking and very much thinking about how we can use technology so that the resources that are available in communities can be accessed maybe without even leaving the classroom or that a visit, a face-to-face -face visit to the museum can be enriched through online technologies. And as was mentioned previously in the previous talk, this is a really important time and opportunity for history in schools. Most, in, uh, definitely in South Australia, primary teachers have not taught history for, for, for a very long time, if ever. So it's a great opportunity, but there's also a need, a need for accessing resources and support in ha how you teach history. And because we know that there are all these fantastic resources held in our um, community museums and the people that are attached to those museums, it's an ideal time for us to be bringing all of those um, aspects together so that we can use the curriculum in powerful ways and develop the kinds of learners that we're going after. So Jill's going to take you into Mr Bassett's schoolhouse now and show you what this is going to look like in practice. Thank you, Mandy. Um, yes, so I'm going to talk about the museum education program that we've been developing uh, in Wollonga and how it ties into the new Australian curriculum and this shift that Mandy's been um, outlining for us this morning about using history as a vehicle 
for developing students into historical thinkers. Um, Wilanga has come up a few times uh, over the course of the last two days. So just to give you a bit of orientation, uh, the town of Wilanga has just over 2,700 people uh, in the community, and it's south of Adelaide in the wine region of the McLarenville. Um, it has a rich history as one of the earliest settlements in the colony of South Australia. And since 1967, the local national trust has played a very active role in the community, both by preserving the built heritage and also sharing its history. Uh, the National Trust manages three of the town's heritage sites, the former courthouse and police station, which was restored by the branch and now operates as a museum, the Slate Museum, which tells the history of the local slate and limestone industries, which were very important in terms of the development of the community, and the Bassett Boys Schoolroom, which was built in 1862 by James Bassett as a private school for boys and has been preserved by the National Trust to show how schools operated roughly 100 years ago. Um, the Bassett Boys Schoolroom in particular is quite important because it was established prior to the introduction of compulsory education in the colony of South Australia. And it's been preserved, restored, and furnished to provide a historical point of reference for both understanding what school was like then and how it is both similar and different to school and education today. Uh, the Wollonga Trust has been delivering education programs in the Bassett Boys School um, Room to school groups for several years. And of course, this has been based on the traditional physical visit to the museum. Um, whilst it's been very popular, like many small community-based and volunteer-run museums with an aging membership, uh, there are significant limits on how widely and frequently this program can actually be delivered on site. Um, I should also mention there are very limited resources that they have to deal with even at the most basic level, like toilets. There's no actual toilets on site. Um, however, with the advent of the MBN in Wollonga and the availability of low-cost video and web-based interactivity, um, <laughs> it's creating new and previously unimaginable opportunities for small volunteer-run community organizations to reach and connect beyond their physical locations. In late 2011, the town of Wollonga became one of the first five mainland sites to be connected to the MBN. And in 2012, the Bassett Boys Schoolroom was the first museum in Australia to be connected to the National Broadband Network. This access to high-speed broadband, coupled with a desire to rethink the existing education programs, particularly with the new curriculum in mind, uh, gave rise to the idea of a new education program, which we're calling Mr. Bassett Schoolroom. Uh, this would be delivered making use of NBN-enabled capability to extend the reach of the program, as I said, and introduce real-time participation elements via live video and interactive web applications. It should be noted, despite saying that we have some limited facilities physically on site, um, it should be noted, noted that this was not about pushing a technological solution, but rather it was about achieving a more flexible multi-mode education program. Mr. Bassett's schoolroom has been developed as an education program to support the teaching of year three in the Australian Curriculum of History, uh, which, uh, for those of you who don't know, explores identity and diversity in both the local and broader context as represented in symbols and emblems and cele celebrations and commemorations. This program integrates a suite of flexible digital and physical resources that will be available for classroom use, both in real time and on demand at point of need. There's also an optional live interac interaction session, which is delivered remotely via video into classrooms by a presenter who is one of the museum volunteers who plays a character named Miss Hawkins, a teacher from the past. And this live interactive session also incorporates live web-based response tools. In addition to this, uh, there's a range of optional teacher-led packages, both for use in the classroom and out of class. Um, including, for example, the school, um, a school case, which is based on the museum in a box concept, where students can uh, handle objects relevant to the program um, like they would if they were going to the museum. Uh, the program has been designed to be a student-centered experience, and the focus is learning through active participation. We wanted to ensure that the focus was on developing and practicing skills relevant to the study of history and not simply instructing or entertaining, though those are important too. 
Uh, we also wanted to create an education program that moves away from the focus on the physical museum as the primary site for learning. And this model provides many more ways for students to learn and many more ways for small community museums to share their unique histories. Thank you. Uh, a key principle in creating this program was to use a highly collaborative community-oriented development model. And one of the many positive things about a small museum such as Wollonga's is that it already has well-established connections with the local community. Because of this, Wollonga National Trust was able to engage with the local primary school to seek the active participation from the principal, the teachers, and the school students in the development of the program. I'll shortly um, show the promotional trailer which we've developed for the program. And it actually features the Wollonga Primary School students and uh, the principal, Mick Underwood, who's actually been quoted quite a bit in the last two days. He's a fabulous man for those of you who don't know him. Um, also, we were very fortunate to um, engage with a film editor that was local, a young person, uh, and his name is Jason. There he is. And also, of course, Wollonga was very fortunate to work closely with Mandy from DECT to develop a program that directly links with the pedagogy and teaching framework of the Year 3 History Curriculum. It should also be noted that the Mr. Bassett uh, Schoolroom program has been undertaken with minimal financial support, other than some limited seed funding from the National Trust, which itself is a not-for-profit organization that's reliant on membership and donations. So Mr. Bassett Schoolroom, as we like to say, is doing NBN on a shoestring budget. Uh, but it's only because of the strong community connections that Wollonga National Trust was able to produce much of this education program with enormous voluntary and in-kind support from people and organizations. This model of community-based collaborative co-creation using NBN has enormous potential, but of course we do need some uh, funding to make it sustainable in the longer term. So uh, the Mr. Bassett Schoolroom program will be offered in several pilot schools later in this year. And we're working with a range of trial sites that have an array of needs and technology to test the program. Um, I'd now like to show a promotional trailer which we've developed for teachers um, so that they can find out more about the program. History today, we're going to think about what schools were like in the past. Looking at photos helps us to do that. Here's a photo showing a group of school children with their teacher here in the middle. Some children lived a long way away from school and they had to walk a long way, or they might have had a horse that the whole family could sit up on top to get a ride to school. This is a photo of the old Bassett School, which is still here in Wollonga. When it first opened, this school was an all-boys school.
Find out what school was like a hundred years ago. Step back in time to Mr Bassett's schoolroom in Willunga. Mick's not that mean, honestly, it's hard for him not to smile, I promise. Um, in conclusion, on our journey so far, we've learned that small is beautiful, flexibility is key, and collaboration and co-creation creates a much richer experience for everyone. Thanks.